Good afternoon everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're watching this from around the world. Today is day one of the Qatar 2022 World Cup. In around an hour and a half time, Qatar, the host country, are going to get proceedings underway, the opening ceremony and the first match of the tournament. So I thought, why not do a World Cup preview where we run through every single team at the tournament. Now I do have a glamorous assistant with me today. Lucy, you going to come and say hello? No. no. All right. Well, at some point, we might have a glamorous assistant assisting with us with uh, running through every single team. So, let's get through it. What can we expect from the tournament? Well, there's 32 teams at this tournament. There is rumours that the next one will have 64 teams, but we'll come on to that another day. So, without further ado, let's get on it. We've got eight groups of four teams, 32 teams in total. So let's start with Group A. So, Group A, we have the Netherlands, sometimes known as Holland, Senegal, Ecuador and Qatar, the host nation. So let's start with the Netherlands. They were the top ranked side in the pots when the, when the uh, groups were drawn. Um, they are the dark horses for a lot of people. They're managed by Louis van Gaal who in 2014 in Brazil guided them to third place. In fact, they were only a penalty shootout away against Argentina from being in the final itself against Germany, which itself would have been an amazing match. Um, before the tournament, unfortunately, Leo van Gaal announced that he was suffering from cancer, of which he is receiving treatment. At the end of this tournament, he's going to be replaced by former Dutch boss Ronald Koeman, which is kind of ironic because van Gaal was manager before. Koeman took over... I think maybe not immediately afterwards, but maybe a couple of appointments later. Now it's Van Gaal, now it's Koeman again. A bit of a, of a revolving door there in the Dutch national team at the moment. But yeah, this is going to be his last period of being manager. Um, Holland have got an amazing record when it comes to the World Cup. They are three times one at runners-up, although they've never won it themselves. They finished runners-up in 1974 against West Germany, 1978 against Argentina and 2010 against Spain. Holland are also infamous for creating total football, which of course is the style and philosophy that likes of Pep Guardiola, even Eric Ten Hag uh, have adopted. And they've influenced teams such as Ajax, obviously Barcelona, Manchester City, Bayern Munich. In fact, almost every possession-based team which has got an emphasis on keeping the ball and pressing when they don't have it was in some way influenced by total football. Um, that said, although they had an impressive qualifying campaign and they did very well in the recent uh, Nations League, they do have a few issues. For example, one of the most pressing issues that Holland have got is who's going to start in goal. Jasper Sillinson has been dropped, so we don't know at this point in time who's going to be their number one goalkeeper, which of course is a critical position. So it's a case of watch this space at the moment in that regard. Um, one of the other issues that they've got they don't have a star striker, a prolific forward like they've had in years gone by, where they've had like Marco van Basten or Dennis Burkamp, Patrick Kluivert, Ruud van Nistelrooy, Robin van Persie. They don't have that prolific centre forward, that world class striker at this point in time. But they do have unity. They do play with that Dutch element of keeping the ball. Everyone is uh, very technically proficient, can play in multiple positions, different systems. It's just whether or not they can put the ball in the back of the net regularly enough. We know some of their key men, the likes of Virgil van Dijk, who's going to be marshalling at the back. Frankie de Jong, who's going to be knitting that midfield together. Um, don't be surprised to see players such as Steven Bergwin, who used to play at Tottenham, get used, whether that's from the start or as an impact substitute because of his pace and directness from the flanks. And Memphis Depay probably will have a big impact, whether he plays as some form of striker, secondary striker, winger, uh, those two up front, in some permutation, will probably have a big impact to play. So Holland are probably favourites to win the group, and a lot of people have got them as a dark horse to get very, very far in the tournament. Next up we have Senegal. Now, um, this is the third time they've qualified for World Cup Finals. It's the first time they've qualified being the champions of Africa. They're the reigning champions, having won the African Cup of Nations, beating Egypt, where Mane, at the time playing for Liverpool, came up against uh, Mohamed Salah. Uh, the headline news for them, unfortunately, is that the Bayern Munich and ex-Liverpool forward Sadio Mane 
is going to miss the tournament. He is a massive loss for them. His energy, his leadership, his ability to score goals and conjure something out of nothing. It's a real shame, not only for Senegal, but also for the tournament in general, where we want to have the best players playing. It's just a real shame that he's not going to be there. He is a massive, massive loss for them. He's a hole that they can't really fill. So before the tournament, he was they were probably Africa's uh, best prospects for progression in the tournament. We don't know how how far they're going to go now. Um, it definitely has an impact on their ability, even just to get out of the group, but also to progress further. Um, they are going to struggle, obviously, without him. And they do still have some key men, some recognisable faces. Obviously, Chelsea pair Edouard Mendy in goal and Koulibaly in defence. They've also got some other well-known players, um, ex-PSG and current er Everton midfielder Idrissa Gay, um, Czech Kurte from Nottingham Forest, uh, Ismila Saar from Watford. They'll all probably start and have major impacts and carry a lot of that burden, especially in the absence of Sadio Mane. They've still got very, very good players. They'll still give everybody, everyone uh, a decent game. Very energetic, very fit, very strong. It's just whether or not without him they've got enough to really do some damage. Realistically, they're probably fighting for second in the group. Third up, we have Ecuador. Um... Manchester United and West Ham fans will probably remember Ecuador from Antonio Valencia and Enna Valencia days. Uh, they're currently ranked 44th. Um, they are probably realistically giving Senegal a run for their money to finish second. Senegal, obviously, as I said before, missing Sadio Mane. That brings them down a little bit back into the sort of the, 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 the realms of, of Ecuador. If it was a fair fight, I think Senegal would be too strong. Um, but that lack of goal threat, I think, that Senegal have got now means it's going to be interesting. So I think those two nations are fighting for second. Um, Ecuador have gone through a little bit of a transition the last few years. They've definitely looked to youth. They were the youngest, in terms of average age, the youngest of all the South American nations to qualify. Uh, they had an average age of around 22, 23, 23 I think it was. Um, their main or most well-known player will be Caicedo of Brighton. Um, there's also Gonzalo Plata. He's a useful attacker. He plays for Real Valladolid in Spain. So those two are probably the two most household names that they've got. But they've got energy, they've got pace, they've got a lack of fear that you get when you've got youth. They've got that exuberance. Um, they will definitely give every nation in the group a tough game, starting with the host nation Qatar in the opening match. Probably will beat them. And it's probably going to come down to the match against Senegal. Um, you're probably looking at six points to get you through a second place. So it's going to be, so I think, a winner takes all between them and Senegal when they play each other. Last but no means least, the host nation, Qatar. Um, they don't really have football heritage, let's be honest. Uh, it's their first World Cup appearance. But being the host nation, Expect them to be backed, even though that this is a country that isn't known for its footballing culture or its mass hysteria when it comes to sport. As we've seen when World Cup football comes to town, the host nation uh, is backed uh, by, by the local population. So definitely expect them to have the favouritism and the partisan support in the crowd. And that can carry them a long way, as we've seen before in previous World Cups. Um, Qatar have had a huge push in recent years. They've climbed the world rankings in almost no time at all. Um, barely 18 months ago, they were around 113th in the world. Now they're ranked 50th. What an incredible rise for them. Um, obviously, with the, with the prospects of work and a better life, or I should say, a better life, uh, they've seen quite a lot of immigration from countries such as Africa. There's been a lot of Sudanese and other countries immigrating to Qatar. As a result, the pool of talent they've had to pick from has grown exponentially, especially from nations that have got a bit more of an athletic or footballing uh, background than Qatar does, which is part of the reason why they've shot up the rankings as they have. They've had players who can qualify either as firstborn or through residency status. Um, and as a result, the quality of player that they've had has just increased massively. Um, the way that they play, uh, well, they're very competitive, very energetic, very much in the mould of Tim Cahill, who Everton fans will remember. He is the director of football development in Qatar. 
So the team very much plays in his image. Individual flashes of quality, such as long-range strikes or uh, set plays. So if there is an opportunity for a corner or a free kick, expect them to load the box. If there's an opportunity to shoot from 20, 30 yards, you should expect to see them shoot from distance. Um, I expect them to give both Ecuador and Senegal very close matches. But I think overall they're just going to be a little bit short in quality. They probably will finish bottom. They might pick up the odd draw here or there. Um, key player for them probably is Akram Afif. Um, he's a tricky winger. He's not afraid to beat a man. He's not afraid to have a pop. Uh, they've also got also got a rather languid, tall uh, left back, not too dissimilar from Eric Abadal, who is no stranger to popping the ball in from 25, 30 yards. So if there's an opportunity to have a crack from distance, they will take it. Um, but realistically, they are going to finish bottom of the group. Group B, uh, England's group. I don't think we need to talk too much um, about England. That's probably been covered to death in all of the uh, newspaper outlets and media outlets that there are. Um, I think we know the score when it comes to the England squad. I was tempted to do a um, an episode on the England squad itself, but I thought that it, in the end probably wasn't warranted because apart from the odd name here or there, such as Ivan Tony, um, I I think overall it's probably the strongest, most balanced squad, most attacking squad that Gareth could have picked. You could have made an argument maybe for one or two different goalkeepers. You could have made an argument for Tamori at the back. Given that Ben Chilwell's going to miss the tournament, given that Rhys James has lost his fitness battle, I think it represents probably the most balanced, most most strength in depth squad, most attacking orientated squad that Gareth could have picked. It's good that he's picked James Madison. Um, it's a bit of a departure, I think, from a Gareth Southgate squad. He's usually quite pragmatic. Usually will play three or five at the back. Usually with two or a double hold in midfield. Um, I don't want to get carried away with hysteria. And I don't want to be overly optimistic. But I think the options that he's got there, if he can find places in a team or impact subs, no real excuses for Gareth now. It's whether or not he's going to throw caution to the wind. Um... England's progress and how England are going to do will depend on a couple of things. First and foremost, uh, fitness. We know Kyle Walker was touch and go, so we need to see how he's going to perform. We've got con fitness concerns over the likes of Calvin Phillips. He's been picked. Um, although Jude Bellingham is probably favourite to start alongside Declan Rice, there are a few players in the squad who on their day definitely knock on the, on the first team picture comes down to fitness at the end of the day. One of the other things that we also need to see is form. There's a few of Gareth's previous key players, such as Raheem Sterling, Harry Maguire. We need them to rediscover their form. Sterling's had a difficult start to his Chelsea career. I don't think we need to talk anymore about what's, happen what's been happening with Harry Maguire at Manchester United. And although the majority of the content over the next few weeks uh, regarding football is going to be World Cup based. Um, I will take the opportunity that the Premier League has effectively reached half time just to do a quick summary over various teams and positions and maybe rank and see who's done best, who's done worst so far. And that will include uh, some of the players, like I've just mentioned, for their clubs and their managers. Um, but Raheem Sterling and Harry Maguire are probably the two most high profile players who historically have been in that starting 11 for Gareth who need to rediscover some form. If fitness-wise, England don't have any injury concerns, and form-wise, if the players can play their way into some sort of form, then England have a chance of progressing far into the tournament. Of course, the draw is going to be important as well. The last two tournaments have been extremely kind to England. If England get a favourable draw, if England don't have any injury concerns, if the players are playing themselves into form, then England are going to be a difficult game for anyone. Uh, within the group, then, England have to get out of the group. I think with the squad he's got and the calibre of team that England are going to be playing, we'll, t we'll cover the other countries in a moment. It's not classic generation for some of the other nations. England should be winning the group. If England don't win the group, I expect a bit of a mini inquest. Certainly, if England don't get out of the group, Gareth Southgate will be gone. 
So England have to get out of the group. England really need to be looking to win the group. Don't need to, to, to worry too much on the style right now. This is more about substance. Go in, be professional, do what you need to do. Don't pick up silly bookings to get suspended later on. Don't pick up silly niggling little injuries. Just go in, do what you need to do. Get the three points in the various games. England should be looking to get seven to nine points in this group, really. Win the group and then get into the knockout stages of the tournament. See who you're going to get. Um, that's what they need to be doing at this stage right now. Um, again, without speculating as to who they'll draw in the, in the next rounds, if you were looking at a chart of a who's who, England need to be looking at a minimum of the quarterfinals. This is a strong World Cup. Obviously, we're not, we don't have Italy there, but this is a strong World Cup, especially with some of the teams that we could be drawing in the round of 16 or the quarterfinals. First things first, win the group, get to the round of 16. But if you're looking further ahead, minimum at this stage is a quarterfinal. Next up, we have Iran. Uh, they are a better side than people give them credit for. Coming into the tournament, they're ranked 21st in the world. So they're no mugs by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, up until recently, they had the world's leading international goal scorer in Ali Dai. Um, they don't have household names. They are a solid, close-knit team without having star quality. Uh, they might end up being the whipping boys of the group, but they will not be a Panama from Russia 2018. They aren't going to get spanked 4, 5 or 6. Expect the games to be close. Expect them to probably put men behind the ball. Don't expect them to be overly expansive. Don't expect them to be too naive. They probably won't carry major goal threats bar set pieces. Uh, if England are complacent, or if Wales are complacent and leave themselves vulnerable to a counter-attack, that probably represents Iran's best prospects of scoring. Realistically, you don't see them being too much of a threat. They are probably fighting not to finish bottom with zero points and zero goals, but realistically, that's where they are. But, just putting the warning out there now, they will be stubborn, they will do themselves proud, don't expect them to be a mug and and lose four or five, probably looking at ones or two. So if you're a Welsh fan or an English fan, don't get carried away, don't be disappointed. If it ends up being a scrappy one or two nil, take it, get the three points, don't get a silly niggly injury, dust yourself off and move on. United States, Team USA. Uh, in years gone by, they've had some very good players. They've had Tim Howard and Casey Keller in goal. Uh, they had Brian McBride, Clint Dempsey, Claudio Reyna. You know, they've had a sprinkling of player to grace the Premier League. That said, this is not a classic all-time United States team from a few World Cups ago where Barack Obama telephoned them personally to congratulate them on, um, on progress in the World Cup. Um, without doubt, Christian Pulisic is their star man, but he's not getting much game time for Chelsea at the moment. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what sort of form and fitness he's in. They do have some familiar names, depending on which team you support. They've got Carter Vickers, now at Celtic, used to be at Tottenham. Serginio Dest, who came through the ranks in Holland, played for Barcelona. He's now at AC Milan. Tyler Adams of Leeds United. And Gio Reyna, who, yes, he is the son of Claudio Reyna, uh, playing for Borussia Dortmund. Um, and, of course, the main man, Pulisic. So they do have some individually good players. They are a close-knit bunch. The United States always give 110% for their nation, regardless of the sport, regardless of the occasion. I just think they are going to be a little bit short across the pitch and certainly strength in depth. Um, on their day, they'll be stubborn. They will knock at the door. They will potentially cause problems for England and Wales. Do they have a star forward who can put the ball in the back of the net? No. Do they have the ability to work the ball, maybe knock it in from the edge of the box? Yes. Could they score from a set piece? Absolutely. But if England and Wales are focused, not arrogant, not complacent, put in a professional performance, they both should beat this United States team. Especially given, as I said, the lack of strength and depth. Um, we don't know what sort of form and fitness Christian Pulisic is going to be in. So overall, you would expect... Uh, England and Wales to beat them but as we saw in 2010 
Uh, these can be tricky games. All in all, if England and Wales turn up in the right frame of mind, set up correctly, concentrate on the job in hand over 90 minutes, they should have too much for this United States team. But they will not be a pushover. They will be a threat. They can change things up. They will give 110% from the first to the last minute. Don't be surprised if they score in both matches. Uh, all things being equal, I would expect the USA to finish third in the group. Wales. The Welsh Dragons. So we do know a fair amount about that Welsh squad. I think Robert Page has done an exceptional job given the circumstances. Not just obviously with what happened with Ryan Giggs in the background, where he stepped up from assistant manager and took the reins in a sort of a caretaker capacity. He's now the fully fledged, full time, permanent Welsh boss, and he deserves that. What they've done the last few years has been nothing short of astounding, and we're certainly in a golden patch going back to when Chris Coleman got them qualified um, Euro 2016 through to now. This, this period is a golden generation, and what we've seen certainly in the last few years is even when Gareth Bale hasn't been fit or has been absent altogether, you know, the likes of Ramsey or Joe Allen or others have stepped up to the plate to try and fill that hole. And I think for the first time in a few years, Wales aren't relying on just one guy. If you think about 90s and noughties, obviously they had Ryan Giggs, they had Craig Bellamy, they had John Hartson. If one of those players wasn't quite there or was missing, they didn't really have anyone else who could step up to the plate. And now they've got the big target man in Kiefer Moore. They've got the, uh, they still call him the Welsh Javi. Uh, Joe Allen, you've got Aaron Ramsey, uh, so obviously the main man Gareth Bale, but even defensively they're solid, whether they play Wayne Hennessy in goal or uh, Ben Davis at the back, they've got experience there, so if somebody's going to miss out, somebody else can come in, lead the line, be vocal, stand up and be counted, I think the Welsh have got some, some good players, they can play a variety of systems, they will wear their hearts on their sleeves, they've got quality. I expect them to beat Iran. I expect them in a close fought game against the USA to come out on top. Might be a hard fought 2 1 victory there. And then we have a home nation showdown England versus Wales. Winner takes all to win the group. It could be that both sides finish on seven points here and it comes down to their general record in the group. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, but, you know, can you imagine that? Can you imagine England-Wales, winner goes through, somebody goes through on nine points, for example, or if somebody's had a slip-up, say, against the United States, and they, they're they desperate to win to, to even finish second. This, this couldn't be set up better, I don't think. Um, all things being equal, if we assume that key players are in form, if we assume that key players haven't had injuries, you would expect England to beat Wales more times than the other way around. But... This is the World Cup. This is international football. I wouldn't be surprised, given how England set up under Southgate and given the fearlessness and the quality that Wales have, I wouldn't be surprised if Wales beat England. And I know a lot of English fans might be shocked to hear that, but it was in Euro 2016 when they played. That was a very tough game. On another day, Wales win that. It was just when their resistance was broken. I think Jamie Vardy poked one in from close range. But I think Wales are probably a better footballing team now than they were then. And I don't think England are defensively as solid as they were then. So this is going to be, assuming there's no hiccups for either side in their first two games and qualification is almost assured, this is going to be a mouth-watering game. Group C, Argentina. Argentina are uh, the favourites of a lot of people to win the whole tournament. Uh, they're currently ranked fourth in the world, but FIFA rankings sometimes mean diddly squat. Uh, last few days, Messi has come out and announced this will be his last World Cup. So expect him and everyone else around him to give 110%. If Messi could win the World Cup, suddenly he is in that conversation with any great at any era. The original R9 Ronaldo. Pele and even Maradona himself. Um, their squad is just ridiculous. I could I could go on all day about the quality of player that they've got. Just a couple of the key men to watch out for. Obviously, Mr. Lionel Messi himself, Angel Di Maria, Latoro Martinez, uh, goalkeeper is Emi Martinez from Aston Villa. 
Uh, Christian Romero um, is in defence. I think they've actually got Hoyth in there as well, who's an ex-Spurs man. Uh, Leandro Paredes of Juventus is there. Paolo Dybala is there. And City's young striker Julian Alvarez, who I think would have more headlines if Erling Haaland wasn't in the team. He's there as well. The thing for Argentina that they've struggled with years gone by, and, and possibly here as well, is going to be the balance. They've got so many options, they could play so many different systems, and how do you accommodate all those different players into a cohesive unit, but one that isn't top-heavy and sacrifices the control in midfield and the defensive solidarity? They've been fantastic the last 6 to 12 months. If you listen to South American football experts who watch... Uh, South American teams day in, day out, they would make a case to say that Argentina possibly had the best midfield in the whole tournament. Um, if they can get the right players in the right positions playing together and the balance between attack and defence and control right, Argentina could well win the tournament. Um, one of the things that we have seen with Argentina, regardless of the coach and regardless of the player, Sometimes they do struggle against teams. They can look a million dollars. If we go back to 2006, when the Raquel May was pulling the strings, they had that infamous game, I think it was against Serbia, where they had definitely the team goal of the tournament, where there was 20, 25 passes, and they, they played like Barcelona, knocking the ball around one touch, two touch, moving it from their own penalty area to the Serbian penalty area. It was a beautiful goal. Um... But sometimes if you can get men behind the ball, and if you get in their faces, and if you're aggressive, if you play on the counter, you can, you can nullify them, you can frustrate them. Sometimes they've struggled. I remember, I think it was in that same World Cup, they played Mexico, which they will do again in this group. And I think it was a round of 16, and it was a tight, tight game. It was one all. Mexico had their chances, and it took a Maxi Rodriguez goal, 25-yard top bins, to, to, to put them through. Um, don't be too surprised, given the teams who are in this group, to see them have to break teams down all the time, which is easier said than done. It might be that although they are expected to get nine points and sail through the group, it might be they have to actually make do with five or seven points, where Mexico and Poland might nab a draw. Um, it could be a low points tally group, this, or it could be that Argentina just decimates everyone in front of them. They've, man for man, I'll, I'll touch on Brazil later, but those two look like they've probably got the best squad, possibly the best set of attackers. Um, but like I said, it comes down to balance, and it comes down to if you're going to have to leave players out, who are you going to leave out? Can they get the best out of Messi? If so, they're going to be a massive, massive force. You'd expect them to top the group, but just as a word of warning, don't expect them to sail through the group. There might be some stubborn matches. It might be the odd 1-0, 2-0, 2-1. But at this stage, get through the group. Don't pick up silly bookings. Don't pick up niggling injuries. Do what you need to do. Get to the round of 16. That's what I expect Argentina to do in the group. Next up, Mexico. This is going to be a fiery group when you've got Mexico and Argentina playing against one another. They will give any team a tough match. Uh, it's going to be a fiery Latin match for sure when those two play. Uh, Mexico are ranked ninth in the world, so they are no pushover and they know how to play. Uh, this is their eighth consecutive World Cup and their 16th overall. Now, when you consider this is the 20th iter iteration of the tournament and they've qualified 16 times, only Brazil, Argentina, Germany and Italy, who aren't here, they are the only teams who have qualified more times than Mexico. That means they've qualified more times than Portugal, Spain, England, and anyone else. So they are certainly no longer an underdog, but they flattered to deceive before. Um, they've got a, an ex-Barcelona and Argentinian coach in Gerard Tata Martino. Um, he knows how to play attacking football. They've got a mixture of old and young when it comes to the makeup of the squad. They've got some well-known veterans, such as uh, Ochoa in goal, uh, Hector Herrera and Andres Guadrado in midfield. They, I think, have all played in at least three World Cups now, if, if my memory serves. Um, Raul Jimenez will be their main man up top. So they've got a lot of... For anyone who's, who's watched a lot of international football World Cups in the past... 
they've got a lot of recognisable names. Whether they've got the intensity and the fitness because they're relying on some of their older players in terms of their starting eleven, that's another story entirely. The younger players who are now coming through to supplement them at the moment haven't shown the same, the same level of quality uh, or consistency. Um, it might be if Mexico get through, they might struggle just with the sheer number of games in the shortness of time. It might be, obviously it's going to be a fairly hot World Cup, even though it's in the winter in Qatar. It's still going to be, you know, decent temperatures, what we would expect here in England as a, as a summer. And it might just be that due to age um, and a lack of a lack of real depth that they can turn to, that might be an Achilles, Achilles heel for Mexico. One of the other things that they might struggle with is uh, they have not picked Javier Hernandez, Chicharito. Um, they're definitely going to be relying on Real Jimenez. And given his injury problems and the fact he hasn't been that prolific for Wolves over the last year or so, a lack of goals could be a major problem for Mexico. <laughs> <clears throat> Poland. Uh, on paper, Poland, like they always do, have got a squad of good players. They play across European leagues, um, Germany, Spain as well. Uh, their main man, most recognisable man, of course, is Robert Lewandowski. If they can give service to Lewandowski, he will score. If you starve service from Lewandowski, then it, it, it just doesn't look like they've got enough across the pitch in terms of a goal scoring threat they are definitely reliant on him up top um, that said they will always play with energy heart passion determination they'll give it 110 percent all the way through um, they'll bring energy they'll bring fight they'll bring competition and competitive spirit in every game that they play but as i say i think they're lacking in terms of a goal scoring threat I just think they're lacking that little bit that if you can keep Lewandowski quiet, if you can man-mark him or cut the service to him, either balls into feet or from the channels, I think they might struggle. I think it'll be Poland and Mexico fighting for second place against Argentina. Uh, as I said before, against Argentina, I expect all teams to put men behind the ball. If Argentina do drop a few points, that will open the group up it only requires, therefore, a couple of victories, and you could easily find yourself second or even top of the group. Um, I don't expect them to score a lot of goals, um, and I think it's a flip of a coin as to whether or not they'll finish second or third. Saudi Arabia. They're ranked 49th. Uh, I think everyone remembers Saudi Arabia from USA 94, uh, where they, I think they got the goal of the tournament in the most unlikeliest of fashions, where Al Oiran scored an infamous solo goal, which was one of the one of the best World Cup goals of all time, to be truthful. Um, they are used to the climate. They share a border with Qatar, so they will get as close to home support as you can expect. So that support, the use to the conditions, definitely works in their favour. They don't really have quality world-class players, I think that's fair to say, and that's putting it uh, fairly lightly. Uh, they do have a, a goal-scoring threat in um, Al Burakain, uh, who scored, I think, 11 international goals for them. Uh, but if you can subdue him, they don't really have a huge amount of goal-scoring threat. They are a young and energ uh, energetic team, uh, an average age of around 23-24, one of the youngest teams at the tournament. So they'll have fearlessness, they'll have exuberance, they'll have home support, they'll be used to the climate, um, they'll certainly have the energy... Uh, that goes with being a young team, but they do lack quality. Group D. Group D. So we've got France, Denmark, Tunisia, and Australia. Let's start with France. France, the reigning world champions, having won in Russia 2018 against Croatia. The huge news for France is that Karim Benzema will miss the tournament, making their initial 26 man squad for the tournament. They flew out there, they started doing some training sessions and a recurrence and a flare-up of a thigh injury that has been uh, a niggling and recurring injury for him for Real Madrid this season has flared up. He underwent some tests and it looks like he's going to need three to four weeks to recover, ruling him out for the entirety of the tournament. This is, this is horrible news because obviously Erling Haaland isn't going to be there as Norway didn't qualify. 
Sadio Mane is missing for Senegal. The likes of Rhys James haven't made it for England. And it's a real shame that players have been trying to push themselves. Part, and this is part of the problem that we, we were saying about a Winter World Cup. That players are going to try and push themselves if they're not 100% fit to be fit. And it looks like Karim Benzema, who's been in and out of the Real Madrid team this season because he's had this niggling thigh injury, looked like he might have won that, that fitness battle. And now it's flared up on the eve of the tournament and he's and he's going to miss it. And it's just desperately unlucky because over the last 12 to 18 months, and actually beyond that, since Cristiano Ronaldo left Real Madrid for Juventus, he stepped up to the plate. He's been Real Madrid's talisman. He's scored a lot of goals. I think this is the most prolific period of his footballing career. He stepped out of Ronaldo's shadow. He has been super consistent. He's shown incredible leadership qualities. Not only has he been prolific, he scored big goals at big moments. You know, you could be a prolific striker who got who scores goals three and four in five nil routes. But it's another caliber of a man if you're prolific and you are scoring the goal that brings you back from losing one nil or the goal that gets you the two one victory when it was at one all. Last year when Real Madrid were playing PSG, when they were playing Manchester City, they really should have lost those ties. And it was Karim Benzema who almost single-handedly pulled them out of the mire. Big goals, a goals against teams of all stature, whether it's the whipping boys in La Liga or whether it's the big, the big boys in La Liga in Europe. He's come back into the French fold after years in the wilderness. We, we don't need to go into the whole uh, Valbuena issue. He has come back to the French team and he... He could well have been the difference between a French side that was a quarter or a semi-finalist and a French side that could realistically compete to retain their world title. It's a double whammy because obviously they were already missing Paul Pogba. So Benzema, as a leader, as a de facto captain, as somebody who has got experience in the big moments, multiple Champions League winner, um... The Ballon d'Or winner for his performances over the last 12 months, there's not really a lot of superlatives that you can throw at Benzema other than he has probably been the best, most consistent player in world football for the last year or so. His goals, his selflessness, his work rate, his leadership, his experience, uh, his temperament, France are going to miss him terribly. And it's a huge miss, a huge weakness, a huge hole for them, which is compounded, of course, the fact that they will miss Pogba. Having that deep line player who can either knock the ball into feet for Benzema or knock the ball into the channel for Mbappe, to not have that talismanic figure and to not have that deep line creative midfielder definitely weakens France massively. They have included Raphael Varane for Manchester United, but he hasn't been fit for a few weeks. His place was in serious doubt and he probably won't be 100% fit for the tournament. So you could argue the spine of their team is massively weakened. So how will France accommodate his loss? Will they move Kylian Mbappe to be their number nine? He's, his best performances have probably come on the right of a three. The likelihood is they'll probably bring in Olivier Giroud. He is probably the closest like-for-like -like player they've got in terms of stature, style of play, experience, the number of caps that he's had for France. Of course, he's won the World Cup with France. He got to the Euro final 2016 when they lost to Portugal. Um, so you would expect that they will line up with Giroud as their number nine and Mbappe in his normal position. There's talk that Anthony Martial of Manchester United might be called up. Uh, but he himself hasn't been fit for a while, although he's had a good season when he has played under Eric Ten Hag. He has been unfit for a large portion of the campaign. Um, France will be a massive threat. They've got a very, very strong squad, a settled manager. They know the structure and the hierarchy of the team. They've got the experience of getting to back-to-back -back finals. Euro 2016, when it was held in France, World Cup final in Russia, of course, which they won. Um... France will be a very difficult team, somebody that you would want to avoid in the draw. Um, key players still within that squad will include Hugo Lloris of Tottenham in goal, Pavard of Bayern Munich, you could say Hernandez, who brings energy and attacking threat if he plays in the fullback position. 
Varane is important that he plays because of the calmness, the quality on the ball, the experience that he has. Uh, Mendy of Real Madrid. Uh, Tushamani in the middle there from Real Madrid, who could soften the loss of Paul Pogba to some degree. Uh, Usman Dembele on the wing. Antoine Griezmann, of course. Kylian Mbappe. Kingsley Coman. I mentioned Olivier Giroud. They've got so many ways they can play, different formations. They can play counter-attack. They can play on the front foot. They can play direct. They can play with an awful lot of pace if they want to play uh, Dembele, Mbappe, Griezmann, uh, Coman. I mean, that's that's a team of pace that would hurt anyone. Uh, Pogba's off-the-ball work rate has been questioned for years, but no one can deny what he brings to the team when he's on the ball. But Tujamani in the middle there brings energy. He brings... I mean, he's got maturity beyond his years. He has been excellent for Real Madrid since he signed. Uh, he is mature. His use of the ball is very, very good. He can bring energy in terms of box-to-box. -box. He can sit. So, France have options. They will be dangerous. If Varane is not at 100%, or if his tournament is curtailed early because of injury, France are significantly weakened. They do have strength and depth that they can call upon. It just depends... How many of their players are going to be fit? What the form of those replacements are going to be? And how does Didier Deschamps want to set up? Denmark. Uh, we all remember Denmark's valiant efforts at Euro 2020. Obviously, they came very close to beating England as well uh, at that tournament. Uh, we remember, of course, the catastrophic, terrible incident with Christian Eriksen uh, at that tournament. And I think everyone will thank God, or whatever deity you believe in, that firstly he survived. And, you know, the fact that he's able to continue playing at such a high level. He's had a fantastic season for Manchester United so far. He really knits that team together. He's the one that makes them tick. Um, Denmark have got good players. Um, Denmark have shown that they can play with a siege mentality. Obviously, Christian Eriksen didn't play again in Euro 2020 after that incident. The fact that they got through the group and almost beat England, could have got to the final themselves without him, shows the quality and depth that they do possess. They've got quality in the middle of the pitch. They've got pace on the wings. Do they have a prolific striker up top? That That is a question. But they will give everybody a game in this group. Um... If Ericsson continues his form from Manchester United uh, into this tournament, pulling the strings, they will be a difficult team to play against. They are a stubborn side, well-organised, well-drilled, so they're not easy to score against themselves. <clears throat> I think they will challenge France to win the group. Uh, as I mentioned before, it depends on how many players that France have got are in form and fitness. Overall, if they were to play each other ten times, you'd expect France to win more times than Denmark would you possibly would expect a few draws in there as well. So, it's by no means a foregone conclusion that France will top the group. Certainly by no means do I expect them to get nine points. It might be the case that seven points gets you top of the group, and it might be the case that both Denmark and France finish on seven points. So, we'll talk about the next two teams in a moment. It could come down to goals scored and goals conceded and fair play as to who wins this group. Uh... I expect Denmark to finish in the top two, and I would not be shocked to see them tie with France on points. Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia always give 110% whenever they play. They're a passionate country, and their players are passionate when they take to the field for their country. No major star players. They play with work rate, they play with unity and commitment, and they are a very together squad. Uh, England played them in France 98 and beat them 2-0. This is probably a similar style of squad, a similar level of squad. Um, they will always be competitive. They'll always give their all on the football pitch. Whether or not that's going to be enough to see them through the group, I'm not too sure. Um, I think they're going to be fighting Australia to not finish bottom of the group. Australia, the Socceroos. Um, this isn't a classic generation like they've had in the past, where they had Mark Viduka or Harry Kuehl or Mark Schwarzer, Tim Cahill. Um, this is a sort of a more pragmatic generation. Um, for example, Celtic's Aaron Moy is a key player for them. Uh, the Newcastle-bound youngster, Garen Kroll, is going to be... Well, he's going to... 
I don't I expect him to start actually to be honest with you he's got at least a three game window here to show Newcastle fans what he's all about um, he's a highly rated prospect they are touting him as the future of Australia um, they don't have that proven Premier League calibre of player to call upon like they've had in years gone by they are a hard working side very together Australians are always passionate always give their all when it comes to sporting endeavours they are going to be fighting Tunisia to not finish bottom. Uh, nobody wants to finish with zero points. Wouldn't surprise me if Australia and Tunisia finished joint bottom with, say, a point each if they draw in their match. I don't see Australia doing too much in this tournament. Group E. Spain, Costa Rica, Germany and Japan. Spain. This is not the tiki taka team from years gone by, although they do have a contingent of Barcelona players in that midfield. So they might be very good at keeping the ball like we saw in Euro 2020, but perhaps without that penetration that they had when they had that golden period of from between 2008 to 2012. Um, a generation of players now retired. Carlos Puyol, Gerard Pique, obviously David Villa, Fernando Torres, um, this is the first time since 2004 that neither Sergio Ramos nor Gerard Pique will be playing for Spain in a major tournament, which is unbelievable when you think about it. Um, the sort of backup brigade in midfield, when they had that golden generation, the likes of Coque or Thiago, they have not taken the shirt by the scruff of the neck. And so they've turned to a younger generation. Uh, Luis Enrique has put his entrustment in some of Real Madrid, some of uh, Barcelona. Um, Liverpool's Thiago did not win his fitness battle. They have not taken a punt on him. He's not in the squad. David De Gea isn't in the squad. So Unai Simon will be their number one. You could expect the likes of Denny Carvajal, Paul Torres, Amaric Laporte of Manchester City, Jordi Alba. They are an attacking ball playing defence. So I don't think Spain have lost too much in that regard. Uh, Pedri and Gabri from um, Barcelona being touted as the new Xavi Iniesta. Carl Zelena is in there as well. Sergio Busquets is in there as well. Uh, so they've got options in midfield in terms of that tiki-taka style. They also have Carlos Soler of PSG and Marcos Lorente are in there as well. So they've got a bit of bite, box to box and energy if they need it. Certainly a lot of options. We saw in Euro 2020, if they want to play with a full striker, somebody like a Danny Olmo can drop in. They can control possession. But it was that lack of cutting edge at Euro 2020, which could be their Achilles heel here. Although they'll have the options of the likes of Ferran Torres, Nico Williams, Alvaro Morata, none of them are particularly prolific. And they don't have a more mobile or alternative for the veteran Morata. This is not like Fernando Torres or David Villa in terms of years gone by. And the fact that they don't put teams to the sword might prevent their long-term progress in the tournament. You would expect them to get through the group, certainly as first or second. Probably no one will keep the ball as well as they will. It's just whether or not there'll be an end product. But I would certainly put them down as favourites to win the group. Costa Rica. Arsenal fans, do you remember Joel Campbell? Uh, Fulham fans, do you remember Brian Ruiz? And I'm sure most of us remember Kaylor Navas. Well, those three are still there, and that is the main superstar headline-grabbing players in this squad. Uh, they are a little bit of an ageing squad. They don't have that calibre of player coming through to supplement or replace them. Um, they will try their best, but they will come up short when it comes to quality. I expect them to give Japan a tough game, but I don't expect them to realistically trouble Germany or Spain. They're going to be fighting for Japan to finish third. Again, this could be a group where one point and scoring two goals could be enough to finish third, not fourth. Don't really expect them to do too much against Spain or Germany. Wouldn't be surprised to draw against Japan. Germany. Uh, this is certainly a rebuilding period under Hansi Flick. Uh, they did not do particularly well in the last World Cup. We don't need to talk about that. Uh, a generation of player, the likes of Tony Kroos and, and those guys... Haven't yet been fully supplanted, but you can see Germany are a work in progress. They recently played England in an incredible three-all draw at Wembley. Germany looked the better team. They look like they're technically, technically proficient, hardworking, tactically astute. That's the modern German football for you. 
Marco Royce didn't win his fitness battle, which is a real shame. He's just had terrible luck when it comes to major tournaments. They don't have a prolific natural number nine. It might be that Kai Havertz has to play that role. Serge Nabry on the wing. Um, they've obviously got uh, Leroy Sane who can come in and do a job on the wing. So they can be very direct, very powerful, very pacey. They can play on the counter. They can control. Do they have enough quality in the team? They don't have Mats Hummels, which is a bit of a surprise. How far will they go? <sighs> We saw against England, they can be bullied. They're not as defensively sound as they were in previous years. Very good at holding the ball. Can score goals. Definitely fancy them to get out of the group, first or second. Um, that Germany-Spain game will be an absolute belter and will determine who finishes first, who finishes second, and therefore their progress in their draw for the latter rounds. Japan. Southampton fans will remember Maya Yoshido. He's on the plane. Arsenal fans, of course, will recognise... Uh, Tomoyasu. Unfortunately, Huddersfield's um, Nakayomo is out with injury. Uh, it's not a classic Japanese squad like in the era they had before with Honda, Nakata, Endo or Inamoto. They are going to need to fight if they want to finish above Costa Rica. Um, I can see Germany and Spain fighting for this group on either seven or nine points. Don't be surprised if Germany and Spain draw and beat both Costa Rica and Japan. And I think Japan and Costa Rica, they'll get overpowered and outplayed by Germany and Spain. I could see the, Jap the, the Japan-Costa Rica game being very competitive. It could be that you have seven points for Germany and Spain to see them through one and two. Could even have one point um, in terms of three and four. I think there's going to be a huge disparity between first and second and third and fourth in this group. Unfortunately, I don't see Japan doing too much in this tournament. Group F. So we have Belgium, Croatia, Morocco, and Canada. Now, on paper, if we look at Belgium, they've got one of the strongest squads. Um, they always seem to get so far, but then they fall short. Um, their individuals historically have been better than the sum of their parts. Um, one of the problems that they're gonna have in this particular tournament is that both Hazard brothers are playing some way short than their best. It hasn't worked for Eden Hazard at Real Madrid. Injuries have curtailed his time there. And Thorgan Hazard doesn't quite look to be at the level he was in years gone by. In order for them to get into the latter stages, they are going to need everyone to be on fire in this tournament. And Roberto Martinez, their manager, is certainly under pressure to deliver. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if he was sacked, if they don't have a particularly good tournament. They need to be looking to get to the latter stages, a semi-final or something, or otherwise I think... He will be gone. Um, they're going to need everyone to be on top form. They're going to need goalkeeper Thibaut Courtois to be on top form like he has been for Real Madrid for the last couple of years. They're going to need the likes of their defence. They've got veterans uh, Jan Vertonghen and Toby Alderweireld in there. Thomas Munier is in there. I mean, in midfield, it all depends on who they play. Leon Dendonka might get some mat some game time. They need him to be um, on fire. Yannick Carrasco... Dries Mertens, although they're both getting on a little bit now, they need them to be firing. Kevin De Bruyne to be pulling the strings in midfield. And they need uh, Romelu Lukaku to show his Inter Milan form, not his Chelsea form. If they all come together, and if Roberto Martinez has a good tournament tactically, then yeah, they could well uh, get into the latter stages. One of the other things is, certainly I think in the case of... Uh, Vertonghen or the Vireld, possibly Eden Hazard given his fitness issues. This might well be the last World Cup, possibly the last tournament for them. So they're going to have to leave it all out there. They're going to have to bring their A game, try 110%. Whatever the fractures in the squad have been in the past, uh, try and put those to the back of their minds and work their way through them. If they can bring their A game, if they can fight for each other, if they can find that last couple of, that 5% that's been missing against the likes of France or others in years gone by, they, they will definitely be a threat. From, a, from an individualistic point of view, and from a cohesive point of view, they've just been short a little bit in years gone by, and I, I think they probably will be again. I think this will be a squad that flatters to deceive, and may well get to the quarters, might sneak a semi-final, but I don't see them winning the tournament. Croatia. Croatia are a squad where a lot of their players seem to defy the ageing process. Somehow Luka Modric, who's about 108 now, he's still there. 
Uh, they've got Kovacic in the middle of the pitch. Although even Rakitic is retired, those two will pull the strings together. They have Brozovic, Ivan Perisic, Petkovic, Kramaric up front. Um, a lot of familiar names. We know what Croatia will bring. They will be silky. They will work the ball. They'll have a target man up top in Kramaric. But without, say, somebody like uh, Mario Mandzukic or Evita Olic, who gave him an outlet on the wing, I think they're going to be a little bit short up top. I think, despite them still being in the squad, I think the likes of Luka Modric might just be one tournament too far in terms of having the influence for a long enough period into the tournament. Although he's a wonderful, wonderful footballer, one of the best midfielders in in generations, on his own, given the fact that obviously Kovacic has been in and out of the Chelsea team with injuries as well, I just think this Croatia side, although they might, they'll might they battle and probably will make it out of the group, I don't think they're going to get to the latter stages of the tournament. Um, we know what they're going to bring. They're going to bring creativity, a bit of silk, um, get the ball up front. It's just whether or not they've got somebody who's going to put it in the back of the net uh, enough times. Morocco. They've got some well-known players, such as Hakim Zayic of Chelsea and PSG's Atraf Hakimi. Roman Seiss, uh, Sofian Buffel are also in the squad. Um, Morocco always seem to have some good players. I remember France 98. Half of their squad seemed to end up at the likes of Coventry City or Aston Villa. Um, individually, they've got some extremely talented players. If they are on form, they could put some belters into top bins against anyone. I could see them giving Croatia a really good game. That could be an entertaining two-all draw, for example. Equally, the fact that defensively, they don't have world-class players there, might be their undoing. It might be that they're susceptible to those who can work the ball better than they are or those who can play the counter-attack well. I just fancy Morocco to come up short in terms of getting through the group. Although they'll give Croatia one hell of a game, like I said, it wouldn't surprise me if they got something out of that game. I think they'll beat Canada, but I think they will lose to Belgium. Um, but yeah, Morocco will challenge Croatia for second in the group, but I think ultimately they'll probably finish third. Canada. Um, it goes without saying, because there isn't anyone else, Alfonso Davies of Bayern Munich is their star player, and as a talented player as he is, um, there aren't anyone else in that squad who's anywhere near his level, unfortunately for them. They do have some players who play in the likes of Scotland and in Belgium, but a lot of their players are drawn from North America. They don't have world-class players they don't have a depth of squad to realistically challenge and i know this sounds very very uh black and white and dismissive of them um they'll try their best they'll play to the philosophy that has got them this fast you know to get to the tournament um it's very unlikely that they're going to get any points or possibly even score any goals in the tournament their best bet will be to shut up shop stick 11 men behind the ball maybe nick a draw against the likes of morocco or croatia I just, I just don't see them doing anything. I don't see them getting any points. And I think it would be amazing if they even scored in the tournament. And I know most people will be like, that is so dismissive of them. They just don't have quality in the midfield or up top. But fantastic that they're there. Shop window for all those players to try and secure a move to a club. But I think they're going to finish bottom of the group. Group G. Brazil. Switzerland. Serbia. Cameroon. Let's start with Brazil. Uh, they are most people's favourites for the tournament. They've got a key men's list as long as your arm. They've probably got the two best goalkeepers in the tournament in Allison and Edison, which is just ridiculous. And very un-Brazilian, if I must say. They're not known for having world-class goalkeepers. Although they had Claudio Tafarel and they had Rogério Saini, who scored zillions of goals. Um... I would say that Allison and Edison are right up there in terms of the best goalkeepers in the world. So to have both of them is just rude on the part of Brazil. Very unfair, Brazil. Um, for a few years, Brazil have had a bit of an identity crisis. You know, if you grew up in the 90s or 70s or the 80s, they had that samba style, that, that sexy football, one touch, two touch. Zico, Socrates, Pelé, Jezino, Garincha, Ronaldo... Um, but they've they've gone away from that after the generation where Ronaldinho and Robinho and Kaká didn't quite do it 
they had a very pragmatic, almost European style, very bulky, very tact tactical. Some of that flair and, and, and technique sort of came out of their game. And, yeah, I think they almost lost their way, for want of a better, uh, better expression. It was substance over style. The best way to describe them would be to be a reverse of Germany. German football for a long time was very had this that, that opinion that it was very organised, very regimented, not particularly sexy. And then Jürgen Klinsmann changed all that, and for the last 15, 16 years, the Germans have been one of the sexiest teams around. Brazil seem to be going back into that a little bit. You look at some of the players at their disposal, Anthony from Manchester United, Bruno from Newcastle, Martinelli from Arsenal, Rafinha used to be at Leeds, now at Barcelona, Neymar, of course, uh, Lucas Paqueta, um, they got ballers in there. Even their defensive midfielders in Casemiro and, Fem and Fabinho are ballers. You know, Paul Skull sits there and looks at Casemiro and goes, I didn't realise he could play like that. And then you forget that he's Brazilian. You forget that in 2002, Ed Milson, the centre-back, played one-twos, ran up the pitch and scored an overhead kick. Brazilians only really know how to be strikers. The best strikers play up front. The slightly less good strikers play in the number 10 or the number 8s. And you work your way back so that uh, those who aren't quite as good at being strikers play defence. That was the sort of the, the joke of Brazil back in the day. Uh, and it's sort of gone back to that now. Um, it says something that, you know, you look at, say, Gabriel Jesus and some of the others that they've picked, that Bobby Firmino from Liverpool doesn't even make the squad. I mean, that is, that's the sort of the embarrassment of riches that they've got right now, that Bobby Firmino, wonderfully intelligent player as he is, doesn't even make, the, doesn't even get on the plane. Uh, they've got Danny Alves, who's about 209 years of age now. He's still there, but he'll still bomb up and down the wing if he's given game time. But that experience, that leadership quality that he's got, um, don't underestimate what he'll do behind the scenes, even if he's not first choice right back. Um They've got talent all over the shop. They've got two players for every position. They've got a balance between being able to break up the play with those midfield options that they've got. They could play Casemiro and Fabinho if they wanted to in there. Um, or they could go all out attack and just blast teams away. Um, they'll probably go somewhere in the middle, to be honest with you, in terms of that footballing style, that philosophy. I expect them to go very, very far. I expect them to be solid. I expect them to be professional with flurries of flair and flamboyance and skill. I don't expect it to be Samba Boy style football. I expect it to be solid. I expect them to play through the middle and have fullbacks absolutely bombing on. I expect their wire players to come in and place and play almost as like inverted wingers. If Anthony plays, you know what he's going to give you in terms of that flair and flamboyance. If Neymar plays, well, you know how he's going to how he's going to play. Um, the only reason I say if there are some rumours that Neymar might be carrying some niggles, he might not make the first game. So, but in, all things being equal, when everyone's on the pitch, you've got the directness if Rafinha plays on the wing. You've got the the silk if Anthony plays on the wing. You've got the show pony and one of the most charismatic players in the world in Neymar who can buy you a free kick if you just blow on him. Uh, you've got solidarity in there if they play Casemiro or Fabinho or both. If they play Fred, you know that you're going to get box-to-box -box energy. They've just got options. They can play different systems. They've got so many players. I expect them to go far. Um, along with Argentina, they are probably the best squad in the tournament. Switzerland. Switzerland, they never have like a glamour or sexy name, but they have good players. They will always work very, very hard for each other. And in tournaments, Switzerland always seem to have like one player who sort of stands out, whether it's Sommer, the goalkeeper, who's underrated. Um, but he's, he's there before anyone uh, uh, thinks that he might not be. Manchester City's summer signing um, Akanji, the centre-back. He's in the squad. Um, RB Salzburg's um, player who's attracted interest from both Manchester City and Liverpool, Noah Okafor, he's in the squad. Um, Shakiri from Stoke and Liverpool fame, Bayern Munich fame, half the teams of Europe fame. 
Um, you forget how many times he's actually won the Champions League um, because of his travels. Shakiri's in the squad, so they've got quality players. They do have some some strength and depth. Chelsea's forgotten man Dennis Zakaria is in the squad, uh, who recently scored against Dynamo Zagreb to help them avoid an embarrassment there. So they've got good players. Uh, they've got players who can play in different positions, different systems. They've got a range of ages there. They're always going to be organised. They'll always try their best. They'll always give everyone a game. Uh, they speak Spain at the World Cup, if I remember correctly. So they're not intimidated. It's just whether or not they've got enough quality. I think realistically they're going to be fighting for second in the group. If they get out and they go into the, get out of the group and, and get into the round of 16, anything could happen at that point. Um, don't underestimate them, but I don't think they'll set the world on fire. Serbia. Uh, this is not a, a vintage Serbian team in terms of quality or the style, like we saw in the mid noughties when uh, the likes of the Manjevic were um, were sort of pulling the strings at the in the defence there. Although they do have a lot of familiar names, a lot of quality players. They've got Dusan Tadic. Um, Selinkovic Savic of Lazio, who every year seems to be linked with Manchester United, but has never made the move. Luka Jovic, uh, Vlavic, the striker from Juventus, he's there. And Fulham's Alexander Mitrovic is there. Um, so they do have quality players. They do have recognised names. What system they play will determine how far they go. Will they play Vlavic and Mitrovic up front as a two, for example? Will they go three at the back? Will they go... 4-5-1. I think the system will determine a lot of how far they go. Um, but the, the, the key thing will be when they play Switzerland. That's a key match. If one side beats the other, you would fancy them to finish second behind uh, Brazil. If that finishes a draw, we could be looking at a scenario where four points or... Um, yeah, four points might be enough to, to get them through. Um, there'll be a closely fought group in terms of those two battling for second place. Uh, Switzerland and Serbia, I mean. Uh, different styles, but similar composition in terms of players who are very good in terms of European level, not quite at that world-class level. Um, they have good depth. They can score from different angles, uh, set play and open play. Um they might cause one or two surprises. Um, if they play too open a system, they'll get found out. If they play too defensive a system, they may not score enough goals. So it's going to be a fine line for them. Cameroon. Years gone by, Cameroon had athleticism and quality. Remember the likes of Michael Essien, Samuel Eto'o. Uh, Brian Buemo from Brentford is in the squad, and he's probably their most well-known and established marquee name. Um, they don't have that world-class and world-renowned presence, like I said, with the likes of Essien or Eto this time around, unfortunately. It's very hard to see how they won't finish bottom of this group, because it's not a vintage um, Cameroonian team. Uh, they don't have the likes of Rigobert Song, for example. Um, it's just not a generation to write home about. They'll always give their all, they'll always be energetic, they'll always have, uh, have athleticism. But they just don't have quality on the ball. Um, I think they'll probably finish bottom of the group. Group H. Portugal, Uruguay, South Korea and Ghana. Portugal, European champions in 2016. Currently ranked 8th in the world. They have a certain international goal score record holder. I can't quite remember his name. Some fella who's got a penchant for giving um, tell-all interviews. Name escapes me. Um, they've gone to great pains at the moment to communicate a united front. Um, which to me indicates there might be a split in camp as a result of the Cristiano Ronaldo interview. Bruno, Ronald, Bruno Fernandes came out because of that, that footage of the awkward handshake. Saying, oh, there's no problem, there's no problem, I didn't even see the interview. Uh, we've seen Jean Mar Maria say that, oh yeah, Ronaldo's really happy. He loves playing for Portugal. Never a problem when he plays for Portugal. Bernardo Silva says that there's no problem. That, to me, the fact that they're saying it over and over again indicates there might be a bit of a problem. It would be fascinating 
to see what the team spirit and the unity and, and the togetherness is like. And it'll be fascinating, assuming he's fit um, and starts, how they play with Ronaldo up top. Um, bar Euro 2016, Portugal have always had a good squad. Whether it be Euro 2004 when they hosted it and got to the final. Whether it be in the Ronaldo years when he was in peak condition. But they've typically flattered to deceive. Um, when they had Nani, when they had Ronaldo, when they had Shamal, even with Ricardo Caresma, you always thought that very individual players, if you could get a tune out of them, they would uh, they would go far. Their midfield at one stage, when they had the likes of Costina, Manish, Raul Morales, João Martinho, really, really good players, just for whatever reason, couldn't get it together to get to latter stages of tournaments. There's the odd penalty shootout loss there. I think they lost to Spain once. Um, but in general, uh, Portugal have flattered to deceive. Um, despite the players they had, Fernando Santos was a very defensive coach in 2016. Wasn't the greatest football in the world. However, with the likes of Bernardo Silva, João Cancelo, João Felix, Ruben Neves, many others, this is a, a team of ballers, not a team of sort of defensive solidarity. Um, a bit like Manchester United, they look like a worse team when Ronaldo plays, as opposed to somebody like Silva up top. Um, they, they do seem to pander to him, given the fact that he could score at any moment. He's their leader, he's their talisman. If he's fit, he plays. If he doesn't play, they look like a better team. Might actually go further without him. But having him in the team when things aren't going well possibly outweighs not having him in the team. Uh, I expect them to get towards the latter stages. Don't expect them to win it. Um, and I think it'll be a straight fight between them and Uruguay as to who wins the group. Wouldn't surprise me if Portugal got nine points and won three out of three to win the group. Equally wouldn't surprise me if they drew with Uruguay and seven points might be enough to see them go through. Um, I think it'll be very close. Uh, they could finish first or second with Uruguay, uh, but I do fancy him to get through the group. Uruguay. Anyone who kind of commentates and watches and reports on South American football, uh, they fancy Uruguay. Along with somebody like Holland, they are one of the dark horses for the tournament. Currently ranked 13th in the world. Um, Darwin Nunes is going to spearhead them up front, along with Edison Cavani. So they've got long-haired uh, powerhouses up front with pace, with power, and could be prolific. Uh, Valverde, one of the best midfielders around at the moment from Real Madrid, will pull the strings in midfield, will give them energy. They've got fearlessness in there, and they've got a sprinkling of experience. Like I said already, they've got uh, Edison Cavani in the squad. They've got their veteran goalkeeper, Fernando Maslera. Uh, former ex-Arsenal midfielder Torreira has made the uh, made the squad. So they've got battle-hardened, tough-as-old boots uh, warriors in midfield in the likes of Torreira. Energy with Valverde. Been there and done it with Maslera and Cavani. And the next wave of sort of attacking talent in Nunes. The wily old defender Diego Godin is still there. And he has made the squad. So in terms of experience... In terms of know-how and cunning from all the way back from 2010 when the infamous Luis Suarez handball if you remember that uh, they've got the know-how they've got the experience they've got the mixture of exp of of youthfulness and uh, should we say veterans I see them going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Portugal in terms of trying to win the group and it wouldn't surprise me if they cannot be separated by points it wouldn't surprise me if they both finished on seven uh, and it might come down to goals scored or the goal difference or whatever when they play the likes of South Korea and Ghana. I fancy Uruguay to get through the group. Um, and yes, they could certainly get to the knockout rounds and possibly even a quarters. And yeah, watch this space. They could be a dark horse for the tournament. South Korea. The 10th time they've qualified for the World Cup finals. More than any other Asian team. They're not quite the force they were where they had players playing across a number of European leagues, whether it be in Italy or in England or, or in other places. And without shadow of a doubt, Son 
from Spurs is their key man in terms of quality, in terms of leadership, in terms of being a talisman. Um, obviously, we know that he's been injured leading up to the tournament. Um, his fitness and his form will have a major impact as to how competitive they're going to be in the group. I think it's going to be extremely tough for them to qualify out of the group. I think Uruguay and Portugal are just going to be too tough, too strong, too many options. They may stick men behind the ball and try and frustrate them. I just think the options that the other two can call upon are going to be too great. And in the end, they'll come up short. Probably will finish third in the group. Ghana, the lowest ranked team in the tournament, ranked 60th in the world. This is not a vintage Ghanaian side, not like, for example, when they had Asamo Jan in 2010 and that Luis Suarez handball incident that I spoke about earlier almost directly stopped them from progressing in that World Cup. Uh, they don't really have notable players. It's not the technical or the tactical or just the quality unit that they've been in years gone by. Statistically and in terms of rankings, they're the worst team at the tournament. They are probably going to finish bottom. So we've gone through all the groups. We've covered all 32 teams, more than 830 players representing those 32 nations. Predictions time. So who are going to be the main contenders for the latter rounds and ultimately to win the tournament? Well, as I said before, Brazil and Argentina are most people's favourites. They're definitely going to be there or thereabouts. Um, even though the spine of their team is missing, I fancy France to be in the mix. Uh, I can see both Holland... And if their players turn up, Belgium getting far. But again, it comes down to form. It comes down to fitness. There's a lot of players who are touch and go in this tournament. And it comes down to the draw. How many big sides are going to draw one another too soon? You want the quarters and thereafter to be where the big teams meet each other. But looking at the different permutations, we could see some of the bigger hitters playing each other in the round of 16 and the quarters, meaning the semi-finals might have two or three big names and one or two unfancied names. Um, I think Brazil, Argentina and the Netherlands, based on the quality and depth of squad, the, lap, the fact that they're not missing key players and looking at the draw, I can see those three certainly getting towards the latter rounds. I think draw dependent and 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 the status of injured players i think france are in that next pot i think germany are in that next pot if they can score some goals spain because of the way that they'll control the games are in that pot and then again draw dependent the likes of portugal england maybe uruguay and belgium just because there's a few teams there who are reliant on their on key players being fit, having form, having a kind draw. And certainly in the case of Portugal and Belgium, individual issues, either on the pitch or off the pitch, need to be resolved. Everyone needs to come together cooperatively. If they do that, those nations will probably be the, com the competitive nations. I just think in the case of somebody like Portugal, Belgium, England, a lot needs to go in their favour. Either they sort out the personal problems off the pitch, which is something that historically they haven't done, or the players that are touch and go in terms of fitness come good, or they get a kind draw. If, they do, if those things don't happen, then either on paper or on form, I don't think those nations have got it in them to win the World Cup. Those who have got it in, in, their, in their makeup include Spain, if they can score goals, Include Germany if they sort out who's going to lead the line. Um, it's just going to be difficult to look past Brazil, Argentina, and for a dark horse, Holland. I'll give you regular updates through the tournament as it progresses. I will include some snippets about Premier League and the fact that there are other sports going on at the same time, not just the World Cup, over the next few weeks. I'll also have some interviews coming up, so watch this space for all sorts of content coming your way. Take care.